Hello everyone and welcome to the second lecture in the topic of intraventricular conduction disturbance and today we are focusing on fascicular blocks. We, of course we discussed this diagram in the last lecture and today we are focusing on these parts of the conductive system which are the left anterior fascicle, left posterior fascicle and Purkinje fibers. And so today we are focusing on these four types of intraventricular conduction disturbance after we discuss the bundle branch block. Today we are discussing left anterior fascicular block, left posterior fascicular block, bifascicular and trifascicular blocks. In order to understand the fascicular blocks, and we are starting with the left anterior fascicular block, we will have this diagram, which is like a simplification of the anterior and posterior fascicle in relation to the normal axis of the heart. We remember these four quadrants representing the axes of the heart, and here we can see a diagram of both atria and ventricles superimposed on the axis and on the anterior posterior fascicles. Let's imagine that we have a problem in the fascicle itself, not in the left bundle per se. No, in just one branch of the left bundle branch, which is the left anterior fascicle. So I could expect that the electrical impulse will travel down through the posterior fascicle and then in order to depolarize the anterior portion of the interventricular septum and the left ventricle at the time it should travel from posterior to anterior direction. So what is the expected axis in this case? I would expect predominantly positive complex in lateral leads and predominantly negative complex in inferior leads. Just simple, the rule of electricity that we use in the basics of ECG lecture. And so, I could expect the axis to be between minus 45 degrees to minus 90 degrees in most of the cases. So, left anterior fascicular block is characterized by left axis deviation, characterized usually by small Q wave and tall R wave in lead 1 and lead AVL because they are predominantly positive. So, I could expect small negative deflection, but the whole positive complex is the predominant part of the complex. I could expect small R wave with deep S wave in lead 2, 3 and DVF because they are predominantly negative. I could expect the QRS duration to be normal or slightly prolonged, not as in the bundle branch block because just it is involving one of the fascicles, not a whole left bundle branch or whole right bundle branch. I could expect that the R wave peak time in AVL per se to be more than 45 degrees because there is slight delay in the conduction velocity and increased QRS voltage in the limb leads. So in left anterior fascicular block, QRS voltage in lead AVL may meet voltage criteria for LVH because R wave amplitudes may be more than 11 millimeters sometimes because increased voltage in the limb leads. But of course not LVH because I would not find LV strain pattern and I would not find Sokolo line criteria because there is no increased voltage of the complex in the chest leads. So I would not find the sum of the S wave in V1 and the R wave in V6 to be more than 35 mm. No, just one of the criteria of LVH, but it is not sure LVH because of the left axis deviation, absence of strain pattern, absence of the call line criteria. So this is an example of left anterior fascicular block in which I could find here, for example, that there is left axis deviation as the complex are predominantly positive in lead 1 and AVL and predominantly negative in the inferior leads. So I could expect that one of the explanations for this is presence of left anterior fascicular block and the complex is slightly delayed. Here, for example, I could find the same. There are predominantly positive complex in one AVL, predominantly negative complex in inferior leads. So there is left axis deviation. There is also mild increase in the complex duration and there is association of first degree AV block as well as that I could find here that there is increased voltage in the limb leads. I could find R wave in AVL to be more than 15 millimeter or even 20 millimeter and also there are deep S wave in lead 3 and AVF but the voltage in limb chest leads is not as high as in limb leads so don't misdiagnose this as LVH. So this is the left anterior fascicle. Let's discuss the left posterior fascicular block. Here the block is in the left posterior fascicle rather than the anterior fascicle and it is not in the whole left bundle branch. So I could expect the electrical impulse to travel down the anterior fascicle and then move from anterior to posterior direction towards the left posterior fascicle. So I could expect positive complex in inferior leads and negative complex in lateral leads, the opposite to the left anterior fascicular block. So the axis is usually more than positive 90 degree, from positive 90 maybe to Post of 180 degree, the right lower quadrant. So left posterior fascicular block is characterized by right axis deviation, not left axis as a left anterior fascicle, and we understood why. 
Small R wave with deep S wave in lead 1 and EVL, predominantly negative. Small Q waves with tall R wave in lead 2, 3 and EVF, they are predominantly positive, and that's expected with the right axis. QRS duration, normal or slightly prolonged between 80 to 110 milliseconds, prolonged R wave peak time in EVF per se, and increased QRS voltage in limb leads. So the only similarity to anterior fascicular block is the prolonged R wave peak time, slight prolongation of the QRS duration, and increased QRS voltage in limb leads. But the axis is the opposite, and the morphology of one EVL and of the inferior leads are the opposite to the left anterior fascicular block. And of course, I would not find any other cause of right axis deviation. So this is an example here for left posterior fascicular block. I could find positive complex in lead 2, 3 and AVF. They are predominantly positive and predominantly negative complex in 1 and AVL. And so there is right axis deviation. There is no association of right bundle branch block here. It is just right axis deviation, which may be caused by left posterior fascicular block. Here also we could find the same predominantly positive complex in 1, 2, 3 and EVF and predominantly negative complex in 1 and EVL2 so it is right axis deviation with slight prolongation of the complex duration. So I just want to emphasize that left anterior hemi block is the same as left anterior fascicular block and left posterior hemi block is the same as left posterior fascicular block they are just synonyms so either one of them it is the same and it is correct. So, of course, now, it is not just simple as this, because I know that many of you have some questions regarding the fascicular block. So, let's answer these questions. First question, does the QRS complex widen? So, yes, of course. The process of depolarization in presence of fascicular block may take up to 20 milliseconds longer than normal conduction via both fascicles. So, there is slight widening of the QRS, but usually not more than 110 millisecond. And so, the effect complex morphology and axis due to change in vector of depolarization, because, of course, the direction of ventricular depolarization is changed with block of one of the fascicles, but they don't markedly affect complex duration, provided that the left bundle itself and the right bundle branch are intact. So, yes, it may slightly widen, but usually it is less than 120 milliseconds. Whereas in bundle branch block, which we emphasized in the first lecture, that it is a matter of complex morphology rather than duration, but in most of the cases you would find complete bundle branch block with complex duration more, more than 120 milliseconds, but sometimes it may be incomplete. In fascicular, usually it, the complex duration is less than 120 milliseconds. The second question, which is more common, left anterior fascicular block or left posterior fascicular block? The broad bundle fibers of left posterior fascicle are less exposed to damage with compar compared to the single track that makes the left anterior fascicle. So, of course, left anterior fascicle is more prone to damage. And so it is rare to see isolated left and posterior fascicular block. And usually it occurs with bi right bundle branch block in the context of bifascicular. So, which is more common? Of course, left anterior fascicular block is more common. And it is rare to find left posterior fascicular block alone. Usually it is combined with right bundle branch block. Of course, don't diagnose left posterior fascicular block until you exclude other causes of right axis deviation like acute pulmonary embolism, pulmonary hypertension, and right ventricular hypertrophy because it is rare to diagnose left posterior fascicular block alone in ECG. So the answer is left anterior fascicular block is much, much more common. So now we understand left bundle branch block, right bundle branch block, left anterior fascicular block, and left posterior fascicular block. So what is bifascicular block? Bi comes from dual in Latin. So bifascicular block, it means that there is combined right bundle branch block plus one of the fascicles are blocked, either the anterior fascicular block or the posterior fascicular block. And of course, anterior is much more common. So that's why bifascicular block, it includes two tracts, the right bundle branch and one of the fascicles of the left bundle branch and that's why it is called bifascicular block. Here for example we could see that there is complete right bundle branch block morphology as we could see the RSR dash in V1 and V2 and also the slurred S wave in 1 and AVL which indicates right bundle branch block. 
Moreover, there is predominantly positive complex in 1 and EVL and predominantly negative complex in 3 and EVF and LA2, so we could find that there is left axis deviation, usually it is between minus 30 to minus 90 degrees, so I could here mean that there is combined right bundle branch block, which is complete right bundle branch block, and left anterior fascicular block. Here the widening of the complex is not caused by the left anterior fascicular block per se, but it is caused by the right bundle branch block and the left axis deviation here in contrary to most of the case of right bundle in which you may find right axis deviation is caused by left anterior fascicular block. Here is another example here as well. Look, we find right bundle branch block and there is RSR dash in V1 and also we could find left axis deviation here. So it is right bundle branch block plus left anterior fascicular block. Regarding trifascicular block, what is meant by trifascicular block? The first thing that comes to our mind that trifascicular means block of the three fascicles, the right bundle branch, left anterior fascicular block, and left posterior fascicular block. But usually it means right bundle branch block plus one of the fascicles if blocked, so just anterior fascicular or posterior fascicular block, plus first degree if block. So the problem here is that we have problem in the right bundle branch, problem in one of the left fascicles, and delay in the AV node. So some authors call this trifascicular block so it is just bifascicular plus first degree AV block but some authors call this just incomplete trifascicular because the complete trifascicular means that there is block in the three fascicles so there is complete absence of anterograde conduction from atria to ventricle so I could expect that the patient has bifascicular block plus third degree AV block because there is complete block of conduction to the ventricles and this is called complete trifascicular block other authors use uncommon definitions that they call the alternating left and right bundle as trifascicular block because this patient has near blockade, blockade in the left bundle branch and the right bundle branch. So shall we call this trifascicular block or alternating left and right bundle? Honestly, I prefer this term alternating left and right bundle because it is a specific entity in which the patient needs permanent pacemaker as there are no reversible causes because it is considered like a warning sign that the patient has an uh, near coming complete heart block. So let's use the first definition. The trifascicular block means as here that the patient has complete right bundle branch block, left anterior fascicular block, for example, here as there is left axis deviation, but sometimes it may be left posterior fascicular block and first degree if you block as the PR interval is more than 200 milliseconds. So this patient has right bundle branch block, left anterior fascicular block and first degree AV block. We have the same example here. We have complete right bundle branch block, left anterior fascicular block and as we see in most of the examples of ECG it was left anterior fascicular block because it is much more common than left posterior fascicular block. And of course there is first degree AV block as the PR interval is prolonged more than 200 milliseconds or more than one large square. Here we can see another example in which there is some slightly atypical morphology for right bundle branch block and there are predominantly positive complex in 2, 3 and AVF and predominantly negative complex in 1 and AVL and so there is right axis deviation representing left posterior fascicular block in combination with the right bundle branch block but there are complete AV dissociation as we see here the P waves are completely dissociated from the complex and so there is complete try fascicular block in this example and remember the management of intraventricular conduction disturbance in the ER will depend on the presence or absence of intermittent mobus type 2 or third degree AV block because bifascicular and trifascicular block for example and also left anterior and left posterior fascicular blocks are chronic conditions and so that management depends on whether there is a high degree AV block as here mobus type 2 or third degree or not and so the decision will be the either admission and the patient would need permanent pacemaker or the patient can be discharged and just follow up. Now we understand at the end of our lecture how to diagnose left anterior and left posterior fascicular block, how to diagnose bifascicular and trifascicular block, and remember the take-home message today, fascicular block is a matter of complex axis due to change in the depolarization vector rather than complex duration, and remember as well that detecting bifascicular and trifascicular block in ECG is crucial in patients presenting with syncope or near syncope because mostly the etiology of their syncope is ready. Arrhythmia. Thank you very much for your listening and this is the end of the topic of intraventricular conduction disturbance. Thank you.